My name is Stephen Rogers and I'm a retired professor from Harvard Business School where I taught entrepreneurial finance and I created a new course titled Black Business Leaders and Entrepreneurship. In May 2020, George Floyd was murdered in America. A year later, I published a book titled A Letter to My White Friends and Colleagues, What You Can Do Now to Help the Black Community. And I wrote the book in response to uh, two things. One, my daughter, after George Floyd was murdered, a few weeks afterwards, she sent me an email and she said, Dad, I am sad and everybody at my company, it's a fintech company in North Carolina, and all of the black people in my company are sad and we need somebody to help us. And she said, could you speak to the black people as if you were the president? And in response to that, I created a podcast called Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, and I'm Sad and I'm Angry. And in that podcast, it was targeted at a black audience. I told black people to do a couple of things. One is, it was at the height of the pandemic. I said, make sure you take care of yourself. Number two, I said, continue your protesting because an innocent black man was murdered by the government. And then number three, I said, help white people to help the black community. So in response to that, many whites were reached out and was uh, heard about it. And then they said, I'm glad that somebody told somebody to help us because many of the white folks were well-intentioned, but they didn't know what to do. And so after that, I decided to write my book. And this book uh, titled, A Letter to My White Friends and Colleagues, What You Can Do Now to Help the Black Community, was targeting a white audience. And with that white audience, I targeted them because there were many people who said, I wanna do something. I wanna be part of the solution to the problem. And the problem that I identified and it's stated in the thesis of my book is that the schism between blacks and whites in America has to primarily do with the wealth gap, where the average white family has a net worth of over $170,000 compared to $17,000 for the average black family. So there's a tenfold difference in that wealth gap. And so it is my thesis that that has been the source of the root cause of our, our primarily challenges between the two uh, races. And then I go up to describe in that book, uh, in my book, uh, the reason for that wealth gap. And I cite three things as being the root cause of that wealth gap. It's not because whites are smarter. It's not because whites have worked harder. It is simply because, quite frankly, the government, the federal and state governments have subsidized white wealth while at the same time simultaneously impoverishing black people. And they did it uh, who were enslaved in other parts of the country um, that were not a part of Confederacy, were also still enslaved after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863. Uh, but in 1865, the 13th Amendment was passed, uh, abolishing slavery. But it had one caveat in there, and that caveat was slavery could exist for those who were convicted of a crime. And what we saw after the 13th Amendment was passed, we saw the creation of these things called black codes. And black codes in the South and in the North were created by local governments, state governments, uh, for the purpose of enslaving black people again. So there were three things that I cite in the book. One is uh, through 300, 246 years of slavery. If you think about slavery, it wasn't done because whites were just mean to black people. It was done for financial purposes. And it was done and it was mandated by the federal government and it was done to enrich whites, while at the same time it was done to impoverish blacks. So blacks were enslaved for 246 years. Um, I know that it's not just an abstract concept in terms of slavery. I know that my great, great, great grandfather, uh, Nathaniel Grant, was enslaved. And he was born in 1819, and then he was uh, born in Virginia uh, into uh, slavery, and um, he was sold uh, to a family in Mississippi, and he ended up having a son in 1856 by the name of Nathaniel Jr., who was also born into uh, slavery. So slavery is not an abstract in my family, but slavery has been one where whites have been able to, because of 246 years of slavery, they've been able over 20 generations to transfer wealth from one generation to the next, whereas that has not been the case uh, for black people. And again, that was government mandated subsidy 
for white people, if you will. And what we know is, we know today that if you stop wealth, uh, white wealth creation, one scholar has pointed this out, he said, it would take black people over 220 years to catch up because of that 246 years of enslavement that was mandated by the federal government. And so the 13th Amendment was passed after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, but the 13th Amendment was passed, which freed uh, all blacks from being enslaved. The Th Emancipation Proclamation only freed blacks who were in the Confederate states. It did not free blacks in uh, the border states like Delaware, for example, uh, that did not go uh, to the Confederacy. Blacks, for 60 years after the 13th Amendment was passed, they would be convicted of crimes such as walking on the wrong side of the street, whistling while they were walking, um, walking uh, while uh, reading a newspaper, walking while uh, having your eyes looking at a white person. These menial things that were created, uh, that were intended to uh, uh, convict black people of crimes for the sole purpose of ensuring that black people would continue to work for virtually nothing. And so those black codes existed for 60 years, which again created wealth for whites while at the same time uh, impoverished black people. What we know is about a million black people were convicted of these crimes. Their services, after they were convicted, they were fined, they could not pay their fine. And so companies like U.S. Steel would actually pay their fines and then the black person uh, would have to work for U.S. Steel for free uh, during the time that their, uh, con their, their, their crime uh, was sentenced, uh, the sentence of their crime. Um, and so this was called slavery by another name and it was in a book uh, by Blackman and it all was created to continue to keep black people down and uh, enrich white people. We know that states like Louisiana, for example, that 92% of their annual budget came from what's called convict leasing, and that is leasing black people who were convicted of these crimes. Um, and then that was followed by 40 years of redlining, where the federal government subsidized white wealth creation by guaranteeing mortgages for white people um, uh, and while at the same time denying those same guarantees of mortgages for black people. So whites, after the Second World War, President Roosevelt said, we need to create a middle class. And the way that he wanted to create that middle class was to get ownership in the hands, a home ownership in the hands of American citizens. And so he said the federal government would guarantee mortgages given by banks uh, to the tune of like 90% of the mortgage would be guaranteed. So the banks in that instance had very little at risk. And so whites were able to take advantage of that, uh, but the government at the same time said very explicitly, these mortgage guarantees are not allowed for blacks. So whites were able to prosper and buy homes. If we look at, for example, Levittown, New York. Levittown, New York was uh, the first suburb built in America and it was finance uh, with backing of the federal government uh, with guarantees because the Levitt family went to a bank, the bank went to the federal government, the federal government said we will guarantee uh, the financing that you give to the Levitt family, uh, but the, with the caveat, you cannot build any homes that would be sold to Negroes. Um, so they did that and the Levitt family built like 15,000 homes in Levittown, Levittown, New York. Uh, many of the uh, World War II veterans were able to buy homes uh, for as little as $800. Today, those homes have values in excess of a half a million dollars. But blacks were denied those homes, that denied access to those homes, and even black veterans could not do it. But this was, again, a government-subsidized program that created white wealth, and at the same time, it impoverished black folks. And so in the book, I cite those three reasons, and then I give uh, some call to action, if you will, of four things that whites can do if they want to help the black community. Very quickly, those four things were one, I asked them to donate 9.21% of their annual philanthropic dollars to a historically black college and university. 9.21% comes from uh, the time that Officer Chauvin had his knee on George Floyd's neck, nine minutes and 21 seconds. Number two, I asked them to uh, spend at least 9.21% of their annual budget with black-owned businesses because black-owned businesses employ black people. Um, and then number three, I asked them uh, to deposit at least 
9.21% uh, of their annual savings in a black-owned bank because what we know is black-owned banks will send money into the black community. And then number four, I asked them to uh, write a letter to their congressman or congresswoman uh, supporting reparations. So those are four things uh, that I asked them uh, to do in the book. It's a call to action. And number four was about supporting reparations because even if people uh, did all, th all three of the first things that I mentioned, black people would never catch up. And the reason we would never catch up is because of that 246 years of slavery. And what we know is, we know, for example, the, the great equalizer is not education, um, because what we know is, we know the average white person who is a high school dropout has a greater net worth than the average black person with a college degree. And that's because of that transference of wealth that occurred within white families that did not occur with black families. So that is my book, uh, A Letter to My White Friends and Colleagues, What You Can Do Now to Help the Black Community.